You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. Good morning. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB FM, University at Albany. I'm your host, Catherine Zox, with Alyssa Lotmore and Luke Stein on the board. Hi, guys. Hi. This morning we have one guest uh, who will be with us sh uh, shortly, and uh, we will be talking to him about his new book, Yosef August. Yosef August is author of Coaching for Caregivers. Uh, caregivers, and this is like a statistic that I absolutely was flabbergasted by, caregiving may help you live longer. That's a s the surprising finding of a new Johns Hopkins study published in the latest journal of epidemiology, which found that family caregivers had an 18% reduced rate of death compared with non-caregivers. And I'm going to leave you guys with that statement because, boy, that doesn't fit with my experience working with caregivers as a social worker. I don't know about you, Elisa. Alyssa. <laughs> Yeah. I worked with somebody, and her name was, and every time I do that. Anyway, okay, Alyssa, what, that, my experience has been very different than this, so obviously this is something that we are going to address with Yo Safe August. Yeah, that's not something, I mean, just from having a family member of mine who took care of an elderly relative, it was definitely a stressful time, so I'm interested to see um, his research and how he lets, how he, his advice for helping caregivers to remain stressed and not uh, remain not stressed and not burn out so i'm really excited to hear this this guest today but you have some announcements you want to make yes i do have an announcement from the school of social welfare it's kind of fitting with the uh anniversary of hurricane sandy uh one year ago we're actually going to be having an event. Um, it's been eight years since Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, um, and they continue to struggle. So there's going to be a service learning group uh, from the School of Social Welfare that goes down to New Orleans to help with um, a lot of the, the work and still helping to rebuild. So they're going to be having two fundraiser events. The first one is on Friday, November 8th at McGeary's Irish Pub in Albany. And uh, MSW professor Dr. O'Leary, blues rock band, is going to be playing. O'Leary uh, at McGeary's? Yeah. <laughs> so there's going to be um, food and a lot of exciting raffle prizes. So you can um, check out their Facebook page, uh, NOLA, N-O-L-A, Service Learning Fundraising at, Event at McGeary's. And also on Thursday, November 21st, there's going to be a show at the Comedy Works um, with comedian Carmen Lynch, and uh, some of the proceeds will go to the uh, NOLA fundraiser. Are we going to have them on the show? I thought they were going to maybe get be on our show and, and talk about what they're going to do. Well, or... hopefully they will be. I think they're still scheduling, but hopefully they will be on the on the show. Good. Sounds sounds like fun. McGeary's is fun. I know that. Yeah. I haven't been there in a long time. Have you ever been? No. It's a cool place. Have you been, Luke? No, I've no. not. It's one of the fun spots downtown. Um, you guys should go. Not that I'm promoting McGeary's, cause we, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a good place to have an event like that. You know, I didn't mention, I just want to say that Yo Safe August is a uh, life coach. That's his, uh, besides being an author, he's a life coach. And he works, I think, with Bernie Siegel. Bernie Siegel is the, the doctor who does all kinds of like spirituality for people with long-term care illnesses. He's a very prolific uh, writer. I've had him on one of my other shows, as a matter of fact. So um, caregiving is one of the big t topics that uh, social workers are, Con uh, well, should I use the word confronted, but that we have to deal with all the time and with the aging population. It's a huge, huge undertaking for us, I think, right now. Well, even at the School of Social Welfare, we're really trying to have more people go into the aging field. We have the whole internships and aging program where they're, they're doing internships in the fields with the elderly because it's just a shortage. There's so many people living longer and not enough people to provide the services so a lot of family members are taking on those caregiving roles and are sort of don't have as many resources so I'm really like I said very excited to hear Mr. August speak more about how we can reduce the stress level and really make this a a positive experience between the at the University the of Albany here in our school, a school of social welfare. So, what do we do? What kind of do they teach a course? Obviously, they teach courses mm -hmm. in aging. Now, specifically with caregiving, what are we doing? I mean, are we are there special courses 
dedicated or devoted to caregivers and aging or what? I mean, I think it really helps just to help us learn how to navigate the system, a lot of courses, and then our internships are the really big key. I know as a, not, I wasn't in the internships and aging program, but I was placed at Catholic Charities Caregiver Support Services for my first internship. And it was really, it was really doing exactly this, working with caregivers, having the running, helping them run the support groups and just act as, help them navigate the system, what's available, what's not available. So our Albany County was one of the ones fortunate enough to have have an organization like this here, but some of the rural co communities and other places, are the people are sort of on their own. So books like this where we can learn how to navigate systems and how to remain, have that inner stress relief kind of thing without always the respite services is a really great thing. Yeah, and I think you and I had talked about this a couple days ago, but a lot of caregiver, caregivers are not necessarily doing it in the same town or in the same location where the person who requires the caregiving is. You'll have a daughter or a son living in California and yet they are the ones responsible for their mother or their father or loved one in Ohio and, and so they have to do it via the phone, via the internet and that presents a whole other set of problems. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people move. We have a a society today where a lot of people move and kid, children are not where their parents are and even I think neighbors sometimes are taking this responsibility. Um, I had a, a little elderly uh, neighbor who recently had passed and uh, the, the neighbor was another neighbor was taking a lot of the responsibility with the financials the uh, you know the the medical re resources available and really trying to navigate and she was an older woman herself so it was definitely a stressful time and it can be family and neighbors and friends and peers who are taking on this caregiving role well you're a neighbor why would you do that I mean because not that you don't have enough to do you're you're not a child you're not the partner the child or you're not related so what motivated you you are a social worker maybe that's part of it I'm not putting words in your mouth but why you as a neighbor why would you do this for this old how old was she uh, in her 90s in her 90s okay because I think it's just you start to build a relationship with individuals and you know when you realize that they don't have any children either at all or around this area and you know you build you build that relationship and they become sort of part of your family you know especially if they're by themselves a lot and you go over and check in on them you know you try to build relationships with those around you and I think when you do form those bonds you don't want to just leave a person there by themselves you want to have them to have somebody especially as they get older because it can be scary it can be scary as you age but did you ever feel like what did I get myself into now I feel like I need to be here and, and once you're there and you're doing it and she depends on you it's kind of hard to extricate yourself if you have to so in all honesty did you ever feel like maybe I shouldn't have gotten involved I think I think even myself and other people who were involved as we had a, a sort of a network sort of would feel a little stressed extra you know like uh oh this is more than I expect it and I think even when people are in the normal caregiving role as you know I know people who decided to care for their their elderly parent and as they were doing it it got to the point where you know it's more than they thought even as their as their parent they didn't realize how gr great of a task this really is and they, they always were like well I'm not putting them in a nursing home or I'm not doing this I'm not doing that and then they took on this role and it's a lot especially if you're trying to work or if you have you yourself have young children at home. did you coordinate I mean was there anybody coordinate because each one of you I assume like the neighbors mm -hmm. how many I don't know how many there were. Four or five. Okay, say four or five. You each had different skills, obviously, yeah. and different time frames when you could be over there. And so did, was there any kind of a written down schedule or anything that was really coordinated and somebody was the head of coordinating? Yes, yes. and you have to. And I think that's where sometimes for the individual caregiver it can be hard when you're the only one. So when it's those types of roles. So we were fortunate enough to have someone who could coordinate and take on different, we all had different roles where we were strongest, but for somebody who is doing it alone, that's where resources. Where were you the strongest? Um, I think for me, it was just the uh, emotional and the organizational and especially just getting, um, just the, the emotional support. That was something that I can do. And, you know, it's definitely a, a hard task. Was the 91-year-old, was she lucid? Was she clear uh, mentally? Or what, I, I was, well, she's 91 years old, but of course I'm thinking of my mother who's fine. She drives, she goes, takes care of her own house. So, you know, how, 
I mean, what was, did this woman need? It was easier at first, but then once a fall happened, things sort of went downhill. So it was then it was more of in and out of hospital trying to do um, rehab and things like that. So it got harder. And like that's when that's when some of the the roles get harder when you don't things that happen that you don't expect to happen, like a fall or, you know, a, a fracture of a bone and things, things that cause the whole caregiving role to take on a new life something you didn't expect something that's now but after a fall when you're elderly sometimes things start to just deteriorate and break down and that's where it can become more overwhelming especially when you're trying to navigate insurance companies and how do you navigate the insurance companies but even more how do you navigate the hospitals in terms of the HIPAA laws which are those privacy laws that you're not allowed to have access to information unless you are unless you have power of attorney unless you're married so you're just a neighbor and let's say you're taking this well, 91 what one happened of the, one of the, the neighbors were were grant, was granted that role um, be, be prior to it um, so thankfully the woman the, the elderly woman sort of got things prepared in advance and that was a fortunate circumstance but a lot of people don't have that especially if you may be younger and you got into an accident and then you need a caregiver we always think about elderly but you can be younger and got into an accident and now need someone to, to care for you and if you don't have those things in order in place so what are the things that we need to have in order let's say even younger, you're 40 years old, you have three kids, you're a single mom, let's give it that kind of a situation. Uh, you're not married, so you don't have a spouse who can take on that role. What papers do you need in order so that, let's say you do get, and your kids are too young to take care of you, do you know what they are, like specifically? I mean, I would probably talk to some, I, I, as I'm going through the process, because I am, now that I have a daughter, I'm definitely setting things up. But I'm, there's things like healthcare proxies, wills, and the ba the basic general ones, but I'm also gonna speak to someone to find out more details, like what is needed so that my family does not have the added stress of t not knowing what is needed and having to file paperwork after the fact. It's always easier to get things done in advance than try to backtrack, especially if myself as the person in need of care is no longer able to communicate or have that and it's immediate you need it immediately yeah. sometimes you need to make decisions about surgery or no surgery and then you're asking uh, a loved one or someone who cares about you to do it in a crisis situation which that you don't make yeah. good decisions in crisis situations or it's difficult to and I think people get scared of doing that so young because they feel like they can never change it you're always able to change whoever you put in as in, in charge good point so, you know what I think you have to emphasize that yeah. we tend to f yeah because you feel like, oh my goodness you know next year I may not want this person yeah. fine you can change it you can change it and that's something that because I had went to a little a, a little seminar on this and they said you can change this information it's not something to that you feel like you have to oh five years down the road what happened if I don't speak to this person as, as closely so it's definitely something you can change but something to look into even when you're younger especially if you have children or other pe other people who may be need to care needing right. to care for you Good point. I think in one extra, because our guest is here, we'll take a break when uh, Luke's ready to get us off the air for a few minutes. But uh, we need some legal courses or a lawyer speaking at our gerontology programs. Maybe we already have that. I don't know. Do well, we? I went to some at um, the Albany Guardians, uh, Guardianship Society does free trainings on all of this. So it's really, really great. Fantastic. Um, free to open to the public. So I actually went to that's where one of the ones I went to and they have tons in every type of area legal housing financial plan financial planning every area so it's really a great resource good information I'm Catherine Zox your host with Alyssa Lotmore uh, we're gonna take a short break uh, this is the social workers radio talk show at the University at Albany WCDB FM and our guest is here with us and uh, we'll just take a couple minutes and uh, don't go away we'll be back in a minute I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I want to be a glass countertop in a new home. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's best birthday present. When I grow up, I want to be a football stadium. When I grow up, I want to be a warm place on a cold day. When I grow up, I want to be a fancy when I grow up, I want to be a bike that races around the when country. When I grow up, I want to be a bench on a forest I trail. I want to be a rocking chair on when a sunny I up, porch. I want to be a skyscraper. I want to be a... I want to be a... I want to be 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 When I grow up...
I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. A public service advertisement brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. Welcome back. You're listening to the Social Workers Radio Talk Show here at the University of Albany. I'm your host, Catherine Zox, with Alyssa Lotmore and Luke Stein on the board, WCDB-FM. Joining us this, us this morning is Yosef August. Uh, his new book is Coaching for Caregivers, How to Reach Out Before You Burn Out. And August's message is this, and we mentioned this earlier in the show, nobody can do this alone. There's plenty of love and support available, but caregivers need to get past their reluctance to reach out and if you want more information about mr august you can get him at www.yestolifecoaching.com he's a life coach welcome to the show nice to have you on this morning yosef so great to be back if if virtually in albany i really have nice connections to to that that town uh, i lived in woodstock for many years so it feels great to be co- coming back to the capital region well you're back here and with lots of information about caregiving as you know we're both social workers Alyssa and I so uh, this is a topic that uh, not only do we are we're engaged in on a daily basis we talk about it on the radio but even in practical terms so um, coaching for caregivers what makes your book unique what do we need to know that's different than all the other texts we read about coaching and caregiving um, yes yeah, thank you well, um, you know, when people are, are in crisis, um, it's a very hard time to, to be able to get any new information, to get any resources or whatever. They're too busy re, uh, dealing with the crisis. When people are, uh, are caregiving, whether it's, it's suddenly thrust on them or it hits a kind of a critical point from when they're doing, you know, small tasks to uh, where it really becomes, uh, you know, a major uh, part, a part of their life, uh, they don't have time to 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 really uh, do something to to break into the kinds of uh, of, of uh, panic maybe that or overwhelm that they may be in. So this book is is really I could I call it a series of ten minute reads. Um, it really helps people to uh, look at at a particular topic, pick the book up, uh, uh, get a, a one of my coaching tips, one of my coaching exercises. Uh, for them, um, you know, whether it's uh, about helping them feel their feet on the ground or feeling their strength um, or really valuing themselves for what they're doing. Um, but it, so it's a kind of a just-in-time resource. It's not another item to their to-do list, which is the last thing that most caregivers need. So it, your book has, like, as I understand it, co- these coaching tips and six major coaching tips because you want to help these caregivers. Um, one of the the um, statistics that I had quoted before you got on the show was that caregiving may help you live longer because I, uh, my understanding would be that, and this is a Johns Hopkins study, that caregiving would shorten your lifespan because it is so stressful. So, um, are, well, let's talk about that. How does it make you, how, what does caregiving do for the caregiver? Well, you know, I was um, actually I was having a conversation with my wife this morning. She's a, a hospice chaplain, uh, and a you're a, you're a good team. Uh, <laughs> we are we are a wonderful team. Thank you. And uh, and she was talking about somebody who's uh, who lost their loved one, um, and was said that her care the caregiving that she did increased her confidence, increased her sense of her own, uh, her awareness and her sense of her own strength. So now she's in the grieving process. And she can draw upon those uh, those strengths uh, and her confidence to deal with what she has to deal with, which is you know the, the, this new phase of her life. Um, I, I, don't, I think the answer to why do caregivers live longer? Uh, uh, you know, there's, there, I'm sure there's some mystery in there, but part of it, uh, my sense is that it has to do with purpose. That they really. Um, are are very much connected with that they have a sense of purpose and there's a there's a force in their life that's drawing them in that way. 
Um, it is a surprising finding. And, uh, m you know, my book is not focusing in on, on caregiver burnout. It's focusing in on caregiver reach out. Um, and, I, and I really didn't want to focus, you know, the, most of the research did show um, the, the impact, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of caregiving, you know, like uh, clinical depression, which is a very a significant risk for, for caregivers. And um, those kinds of w impacts on career, relationships, and those kinds of things. And all of a sudden, Dr. David Roth comes along with this study saying that caregivers live longer. And by the way, he and I have started conversation, and I, and, and I really look forward to, to, uh, to potentially collaborating uh, with him about it. But I think the issue is really uh, to take this good piece of news and to focus on, so now how can caregivers live better rather than just live longer and focus on their resilience and, and uh you know, having a life as well as a as a as a, as a, a caregiver role and other roles that people have. Well, you start out with talking in in your book about transforming our caregivers, transforming their resistance to reaching out, uh, and and not only doing that, but feeling positive about what they do. So let's take a scenario that you've 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 enc you're a life coach, so that you've uh, encountered with a let's say a family, and you have some resistance in the family to caregiving in a specific situation. So let's be specific about a. Uh, um, an example overcoming uh, resistance yeah like you have um, a situation where someone requires caregiving within a family and yeah. you do have some resistance to family members and or partner who whomever it is to wanting to do this right so so uh, okay so the, the kinds of things that I've heard from families and I've interviewed uh, quite a number of families who who, who uh, have, have done a very significant amount of caregiving is, is really is is um, people's beliefs about what it would mean if they would uh, if they if they would reach out for help. There's a there's, there's a very primary uh, fear that people have, which is that they are nobody else can really do what they know how to do for their loved one. They can't trust letting go even a little bit, because if they did, uh, their loved one wouldn't get the right kind of care. They they know the nonverbal. They know know those kinds of things. Um, there's another fear that people have of, uh, of as soon as they would start to reach out, all their privacy would be gone. Um, and things that are, privacy is very important to, to most of us. Um, so that that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, a barrier for them to be reaching out. I'm not talking about a scenario so much as I am talking about some core beliefs that hold people back. Okay. So privacy being one of them. And right, right, and and uh, so, so and privacy, of, you know, fear of being mm -hmm. in, intruded upon. Um, Are you also, talking about like in an example? Let's say you have. Uh, what do you mean that you're going to have other healthcare workers in your home? People are going to know how you, your personal family matters, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I'm talking about say you're a member of a of a congregation, you know, and you put it out on on the listserv you know, in your congregation to say that you, know, you can really use some help, but you're on overwhelm. And all of a sudden, what's going on with your loved one? Um, all the, the, the details of, of that situation, which could be very private. And it's not just your privacy, it's the privacy of your loved one who you're taking care of. Um, so at that point in time, you could really use the kind of help that would be coming forth, whether it's spiritual help or, you, or it's, it's a matter of somebody uh, driving uh, the kids to their activities uh, or whether it's bringing some hot meals uh, once a week uh, to the house or, or whatever. But it could, there, there's so much help that could be uh, mobilized, but, um, but people holding back because once they do that, their, their life is like now every conversation when people come forward towards them they're not relating to them in their in their ordinary fullness of their life they're relating to them as as a person who has a need and that's that's a very different way of encountering people how do you overcome that i mean i think you hit a, a hot button for me um, and I never thought about it quite in that way until you're describing it, but it's true. I mean, whatever group you belong to, if you ask them to help you, suddenly they know all the activities that your kids are going to. They know what your house looks like, all of those kinds of things. I never had thought about it in that way. So how do you overcome that resistance to, to let's say, you need help as a caregiver? Um, what do you do? I mean, how do you overcome that fear of losing your privacy? Or 
Right. Well, well, that's a it's a great question. By the way, to the degree that your audience includes uh, uh, people who are social workers, those folks are certainly pivotal to helping people really look at those beliefs and uh, and to say, you know, to what degree is this tr is this really true? And you kind of work work through those beliefs. There are some exercises in my book to do that. Um, I call the the the. Uh, those beliefs, one way of kind of organizing them, and it's a playful, uh, it's the syndrome that I invented uh, based on an interview with one person on one train. This is a little different than the research I've been involved in over the years with Johns Hopkins, which is really very uh, clinically oriented and what have you. This, I turned to a woman on, a tra on an Amtrak train and said, excuse me, would you think people have more trouble uh, giving or receiving? And she immediately said, <laughs> receiving. So I named a disorder called RDD, Receiving Deficit Disorder. And <laughs> is that in the new DSM, what is it, five or six, Alyssa? Yeah. I don't know. What, yeah. I don't know if it's a reimbursable DRD <laughs> or whatever it is, right? But, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's one that once you, know, once you start to get out of it being so, so, so serious in a way, you call it RDD and you know you have something you can play with. And I say there's like a 12-step a program which is for, for this, which is you reach out 12 times, and by that time you don't have RDD anymore. Um, but I'm, 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 however, I'm, I'm being playful about it, but, uh, but it's, it's really um, a matter of, um, of, of, of people learning that there are things they can do to take care of some of the concerns that come up, for example, around privacy. Um, in my book, I have something I call the Declaration of Interdependence, and it's, 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 a, it's a document that people can just use to stimulate their own thinking about what do they want to tell the world about the kind of help they need and how they want it to be delivered, and what they want and what they don't want, so that it starts to let people know um, there, that there are really parameters around the family. Um, you know, like with... with uh, do, you write, do you write it down? Do you write it down? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, like because yeah, if it's a yeah. declaration of interdependence, like yeah. our Declaration of Independence, you have to write it down. Be very you, specific. Right. You don't have to do it with a quill pen, but you, <laughs> you could write it down. And uh, but the the other, you know, um, with things like Facebook, people more and more people, you know, know about privacy settings. Um, you know, really, it, it literally lets you know, you know, uh, lets lets the uh, the world in or out, depending on different ways that you select. Uh, the care sites, uh, which are one of the things that I, I really want to, to spread the word about, these caring bridge and lots of helping hands and care pages. Um, I'm not sure if your listeners are, are familiar with those, um, but they're, they're, they're these Well, Alyssa's websites. shaking her head, so you're familiar with it. I think a, yeah. lot, I think a lot of our yeah. listeners, uh, just because it's a social work base, are, are familiar with some of those, but I think uh, it's always extra a good reminder to what where we can go for access to these things yeah well this you know those things i could go into that a little more if you'd like to but i want to say that on these care sites uh you can decide who gets to visit your care site it could be really only your immediate family or your you know small inner circle of friends oh i didn't or know could, that wow. yeah or it could be wider or it could be the entire world like some of the families that i i interviewed uh for my book uh, had thousands of people around the world praying for them, writing affirmations, uh, telling them that their lot, their own lives have been changed by 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 being able to to be a witness to 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 the journey, you know, of the family. Um, people's lives, who you know, their perspectives on life really changed. So, uh, but you can set those privacy settings, um, and and it's really important because. Uh, you know, for most of us, we do have it, 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 who we who we in, include and, and don't include in in, in, a, in in these intimate parts of our lives. Really important. Now, can I ask you a question? When we have we have so many people, like I know several people who are caring for a, a loved one. Is there anything that I, as a friend, should or shouldn't do? Is that for the people who are in that role of the friend of the caregiver? What should we do, or should which which we not do in regards to help? Yeah, oh, I love that question. I really do. Do you know the the, the, the remember the, the mothers against drunk, drunk driving? Yes. You know right. Um, and I I, I read I read up a little bit about their history. Well, these few women c created a, an awareness in this country that's you know incredible. 
friends don't let friends drive drunk, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that their slogan, right? So in terms of friends here, friends, I say that friends don't let friends burn out. I like that. Okay. Any, any more than they let them drive drunk. Mm -hmm. So like most, there are 66 million caregivers in the United States alone. How many of those caregiver, family caregivers are on the way towards burnout if they don't do something to prevent it? You know, I mean, just, you know, just think about it. like how many people, are, most people are either caregivers or no caregivers. Mm -hmm. And what happens is so often that friends watch their friends burn out. I mean, they, it, and, it's, and it's, not their, uh, it's, it's not their intention at all, um, but they don't, in, they don't come forward uh, because they're afraid of intruding. They're afraid mm -hmm. the person will, you know, bite their head off for, you know, for, for intruding. Yep. You know, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of barriers, I think, that people may have to that. But I would really suggest that friends uh, offer, at, like, to ask uh, the, their caregiver friend, um, are they open to talking about how, how, how they're experiencing caregiving? Uh, and uh, and to, to start a con are they, and, and, and in what way could they have a conversation with? I mean, asking permission to uh, to discuss it with them, and uh, the, the, and then you know the, I have a the, there are six um, uh, tips that I have for resilient caregivers, and they could actually walk through these uh, steps with with their friends, or they could just simply do what they can naturally do. But find out. I I would say one of the things is is helping the friends to feel um, their feet on the ground uh, and accept that wherever you are is where you are. Uh, Yosef, what about this guilt? I want you to address the, the feelings of guilt that, and at least in my experience, caregivers have if they they, are, they, they get so much into the caregiving. Uh, let's, and we'll take the example of a spouse um, or a partner and that they feel if they leave them for uh, even for an hour a day that they are doing the wrong thing, that, the, they, that they can't leave the person with somebody else or they can, respite care I think is a good um, example of giving the caregiver some opportunities to get away way and the opportunity may be there but the person who's doing the caregiving feels guilty I can't leave them so you have to help them to separate how do you do that yeah it's a, uh, also that's a, a really very in insightful kind of question and it's um, I don't I don't think that there's necessarily a very simple answer or one that's you know universal for different people but um, the, my sense is that um, if if a friend could be uh, uh, helping their the caregiver friend um, to look at uh, what are some very very simple practical things that ne need to get handled today, not in general but like today, you know the cleaning needs to be picked up, the this or that or what the different things that need to get handled, and to 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 pick something that is really that the caregiver would n would usually need to do and. To, pick up that task um, and maybe along with that um, to offer to um, to just be in the house at a, at a particularly undemanding part of the cycle of the day I mean there are times in the morning particularly and at night where the caregiver has to really be much more involved and intense but choose a time where there's an hour or an hour and a half where it's really like maybe the loved one sleeps or some but some piece of time where it's not terribly demanding of their time and uh, and and offer them that hour hour and a half for the for the, the caregiver to go out get themselves a massage uh, have their nails done um, uh, go shopping um, uh, just simply uh, take a walk um, you know look at nature um, but to do something in a small dose where they can experience that the that their their loved one survived it uh, and they they were able to have a moment of you know, like spaciousness of breathing of getting refreshed you know the word refresh comes up but I'm also thinking as you're yeah. describing the situation it's like when you leave your kid for the first time and like I I can't leave him or her and and I remember a girlfriend said to me when after I had my first you've been with him for six weeks you have to go out for dinner you have to leave and it was like he's not going to survive unless like 
stay here, but he did survive. And so, you know, it's it's it really a similar kind of, of thing. And also you do get refreshed. I mean, it gives you, it just gives you a different perspective and it doesn't take, you don't have to go away for a week. You can go away for two hours. It, that's exactly true. And um, it's, you know, I call the, the um, I use the word trance a lot in describing uh, kind of mindset that, that, that all of us can fall into. Um, and, you know, there are times when we're worried. There are times when we're overwhelmed. There are times when we're extraordinarily happy and, you know, popping out of our skin. But when we're in those kind of places, I call it a trance. And the, the trances that are, that are really wonderful and life, and life uh, affirming, um, those are ones that we don't have to do anything about other than to continue to have more and more of them. But we're, if we're in a trance like um, the, the, that, uh, we are the, the our loved one. Total life and well-being depends on. It, it's as if it's as if um, we're giving them mouth-to-mouth breathing, a resuscitation. And if we miss <laughs> if we miss one of them, <laughs> it's all over. You know, that's the kind of trance. Uh, I call it a martyr trance. I mean, this particular one. And um, it, and if somebody's in a martyr trance, martyrs are known for uh, a lot of admirable qualities, but they're not known for uh, keeping their jobs. No. <laughs> right? Uh, they're you know I, what I'm, I mean. It, and and if people if people do not snap out of those trances, um, they'll burn out. And if they burn out, they'll do the thing that they are the most fearful of which is abandoning their loved one mm-hmm. and that's un, that's a non-starter we're not going there that's so, not going to happen yeah so as friends and we see this happening we we want to become involved in your book you have mentioned some of the smartest and dumbest ways we can reach out can you speak a little bit more about that yeah right how about um, the dumbest ways <laughs> the dumbest let's go to dumbest let's go to okay. dumbest first yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those came most easily to me of course right yeah um so should i run through a few yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I have a baker's dozen. So let me see. We uh, so stop me if it's you know if it's too much here. Assume it, it's best for you to tough it out alone. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Assume the other people that other people know what you need. Yeah. Focus on not hurting other people's feelings. Be afraid of asking too much of other people. Mm-hmm. Think that asking for support shows weakness on your part. Mm-hmm. Take help and support on any terms people offer it, otherwise known as suffering fools, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Take other people's lack of help as a personal affront. Mm-hmm. Assume you must let go of personal privacy and boundaries during this time, which we spoke about before. Uh, oh, I, and here's one that I just actually said, feel like you have to suffer fools. Let people wear you down with unwanted information and advice. Mm-hmm. How about that one? Yeah. Right? Uh, assume that by opening up to support, you have to be open with everyone. Mm-hmm. Think that only you can get everything done correctly. Mm-hmm. And assume that you won't get burned out later because you're able to handle things well now. Yeah. Well, those are the, I was going to say the Ten Commandments, the 13 Commandments yeah. of Caregiving, yeah. and you should put them on your refrigerator, yeah. because yeah. I think you've touched on all of it, yeah. like, it, at least to me, I yeah. can't think of anything else, but those are all the issues, and if you you have to look at them on a daily basis, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, make a copy of them. A little uh, magnet. And I, I'd like to mention just one thing, if I might, that with this, um, I, th- my book, uh, Coaching for Caregivers, is is available in you know in print and it's available um, on a in a Kindle on a Kindle um, you know the ebook, mm-hmm. and on Veterans Day we're going to give this the book will be available for free and I really uh, advise people to go uh, to go and get it on Veterans Day on Amazon um, because it, it it has these in it but it also has another another thing in it that that I think is particularly fun for caregivers particularly who are feeling isolated. It has a new thing called widgets. Um, not w- the widgets are something that people who do websites know mm-hmm. about, but these are, at, at 15 places in the book, a place where readers, particularly you know caregivers, can reach out to other caregivers like by getting involved in a conversation uh, with other caregivers, like, uh, uh, um, you know, this I'm, I'm handling this one. How heavy is your? Are you handling more than you can handle right now? And it gives people a chance to like vote on that question and then enter a conversation. And readers anywhere in the world 
can be in that conversation with them. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that it would be a, a useful way for people to access this. Do people around the world, and I assume this is true, they do caregiving differently. So if you have access to people around the world who are doing caregiving within their own culture, they may have things to add that we're not aware of, say, in the United States. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe very specific things. There are institutions you can reach out to or different uh, caregiving facilities, but just maybe cultural things that may be somewhat different and helpful. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience, but when you talk about this, you know, it's a worldwide uh, you know, in terms of the information one can get, right. yeah, I think it's it's this is it's an exciting um, area to, to explore more. I just want to say one thing about language here. In England, they call caregivers carers, C A R E R S. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that an interesting word? Yeah. So, uh, what is carers versus caregivers? What's the difference? Yeah. I, I well, I mean, so, I don't. I, I have a feeling that if you were if you were just like looking at it from the outside, it would probably much look pretty much the same. I don't know intrinsically, you know, what they may be doing differently, but a care a carer is somebody who cares. Yeah. You know, I I would prefer to be with somebody who cares rather than who, somebody who gives care. Yeah, um, and just an interesting thing. So, so I really don't know, but it, it's a fascinating um, thing to explore about the the what kind of cultural assumptions do we have in the different cultures we have in our country, uh, the cultural cues and, and ways that we maybe limit the way we care that we care mm -hmm. or we receive care. And uh, it would be a fascinating thing to, if, to get to get some wisdom from other cultures. Well, caregiving kind of implies. I'm thinking about it as you're talking, giving that you have to give something of yourself. You're giving something away. The caregiver, whereas a carer is a much more kind of an ind to me anyway, so independent. It, it sounds much more. You're a carer. That's who you are. That's what you do. But it's not taking away from you. Yes, it's, you know, I just as you were saying that, I, I, I love this conversation. <laughs> I really, I'm having a ball discussing this with you right yeah. now. If I was just thinking about, could you imagine instead of saying that we, lo, instead of loving, we called it love giving. Mm -hmm. Good example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who wants to be with a love giver? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that before, but or yeah. they take caretaker. Like, could you imagine a love taker? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it makes it, yeah. When you think about it like that, yeah. it definitely changes the the perception of it. Yeah, it sets up a whole different dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. do you have any, okay? That's England. Do you have any more examples now? I mean, you've got me. I'm, I'm very curious because I, I would like yeah. everybody to actually go go on Google and yeah. and explore it a bit, and then and then. Uh, Maybe let you know, or or go to my website and communicate with me about about it, because I really would love to know what people know or they find out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a it's a fascinating area, isn't it? Well, it's such a, it's a it's something that is across the board. No matter what culture you're in, there's somebody who's going to be caring for a loved one, and it's just interesting to see all the different types of of ways that we we reach out to people and we the different cultural ways that we care for others. So it's definitely an interesting. It will. De I will definitely be googling it later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. By the way, in this country, you know, they've been hospitals over the last maybe twenty years. They've made it more possible for family members to stay over in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But in in other in some other cultures, that's what they do. Yeah. And they and they bring the food in themselves. Yeah. And you know, um, and I'm so, and I, whether that's helpful or not. I mean, you know, w w that we'd want to do that or not. It's. But it's it's something that for us it was an innovation, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, well, I think hospice did some of that. Uh, one of my my best friend actually a year and a half ago uh, died of ovarian cancer, and she died in hospice. And uh, and I've mentioned this on the show before, but uh, while she was there uh, the last week before she died, um, her sisters and I and a couple other friends were there and in in her room and eating and talking and drinking wine and talking to her and making it it was it was we are saying goodbye but kind of saying goodbye in the same context that we had known her not this austere hospital situation but it involved all that involved the eating and the drinking and the talking and and the connecting at the end 
Yeah, and 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 hospice and, has, and uh, you know has has been a major force of of sort of setting up another kind of a of a, of a way of a culture of, of of doing exactly that. There's another one that's called Plain Tree. Um, that's a, a model of of creating those kind of environments. And actually, the VA in Albany um, has that implemented in their in 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 their hospital. Um, but I mean, you know, like families bake bread on the unit. Mm -hmm. And and they can call it aromatherapy or whatever they want to, but there's nothing like the smell of bread <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> being baked. As a, um, yeah, as opposed to medication and all that sterile kind of stuff. Yeah, exact, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've talked about that list, that dumbest list. Okay, yeah. but and we also have talked about smart things to do because that's we all you know the smartest things and the dumbest things. Right. Um, what would be the top five, or now like the top three, let's say, smartest things we can do, you know, who, social workers, professionals, because it's different. You know, if you have social workers, if you're a social worker, you have one certain things to offer. If you're a lay person, you may have other things to offer. So, um, and how does the caregiver go about, I say present, carer, I think I like that better, presenting themselves to the family. Let's say I have these skills without being intrusive. Um, wait, so I'm not sure of the last part, part of, what, of the like, question. I always ask yeah, three questions yeah. in one. Okay, let's yeah. the last question. Like you're a care, you're somebody who wants to help the caregiver. You're one of those yeah. people out there, and you have a certain set of skills, whatever it is. You may be a social worker, you may be a physician, you may be a counselor, you may be an artist, whatever it is. How do you go about approaching that person? Uh, maybe you're not real close to them. You're not a best friend, but you feel you have something to offer. How do you do it without being intrusive? What's the first step to take? Let's say you're a member of that congregation you were talking about in church no. or group. Right. So uh, I would really, it goes back to, I think, what we've spoken about uh, earlier in this conversation, which is the first thing is to ex express um, love and interest and concern and, and ask permission to have a conversation about that. I mean that's a that's a very that can that opens up or it doesn't open up the 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 the, the window to you know the other um, kinds of, of things. But that's that that's a real um, I really I really care uh, about Roberta and what's going on with her, and I care about you, and I would really like to be helpful to you. Uh, can we talk about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah, okay, I mean, and I'm gonna, and and you know, when you, I want to bring this one up too, because this happens, or it's happened in yeah. when you dealing with families as a social worker. What if you you have a family and you have uh, mother is ill and you have three siblings, two of whom were very close to mother, uh, one of whom wasn't, and the two who are very close are engaged with mother, um, the third one is sort of out of the picture mm -hmm. um how do you deal with it and maybe fighting with the siblings about what should be done about mother uh because and and has some maybe positive things to add to it maybe certain skills to add to it perhaps that person is a lawyer but they really haven't been close to mother i mean i'm kind of complicating the situation but yeah. that, that's very often the case especially with what we deal with as social workers so um it's not always easy to engage say the three the siblings who have had very different relationships with the person that you're caring for yeah it's it's that is that's that's very normal <clears throat> and it's and it's i mean it's it's, it's a, and it's very complex um you know because people bring the, their history to what's going on you know um so um they're uh i mean they're, they're you know they're I don't know that people will have the inclination to do some to get some family therapy or do some family systems work, but obviously that it could be a ripe time for that. Um, I have a friend who's uh, blessed by having uh, an extraordinary extent, a close and extended family. They have a, a a family meeting every week, and it's a and it's a virtual meeting because they're 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 not in the same place and whatever. And that's one way that they connect with each other um 
but the you know the thing about how do you negotiate with it, with it, with uh, I mean the, it's it's very complex and I'm not sure in this you know in this in this in this uh, program right now that we can <laughs> kind of <laughs> um, but you know there's it, it always it's inevitable there's always somebody who lives closer and is and and allows themselves to be overburdened and 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 and, and what have you and there's somebody who's who uh, is is from from afar and either. They, they, they. Uh, it's just not as important to them, or you know, they have a family history, or they feel really guilty, um, and they're still not doing anything. It's, it's. You know, it is complex. Uh, in, in. Uh, um, you know, in my, in my own uh, family uh, history, uh, my sister lived in Jerusalem, <laughs> and I lived in New York, and my parents lived in Florida. Wow. You know? And. Um, and I mean, it turned out we had a very positive working relationship, my sister and I. And there was a certain point when I could not handle having two parents dealing with hospitals at the same time, and and she had to come <laughs> from Israel to do it. Um, but we, you know, we were somewhat of a tag team with it. Um, but um, I. I, but many not, families are not able to do that, and yeah. they have such, perhaps the siblings have such animosity to be before all of this happened, and then yeah. the expectation is they're supposed to get along in this kind of a crisis, and not only do they not get along, but their animosity is exacerbated. So, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know that we have to have a solution, but I think it's good to put it out there because many yes. people feel like they're isolated and alone, and everybody else has this yeah. extended family that's doing wonderful, and they're not necessarily, and maybe that's just okay you know we all have the is- right. these issues yeah mm-hmm. well yeah and, and you know i just wish we could you know kind of like say a message you know just somehow or other bring the highest force the highest personage to to the, to, 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 to speak to them and say um this is too important to to indulge your 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 stuff in you know your your uh your dynamics with your sibling this is too important it's just um uh we we you know we can't afford to, to to have this happen. There's something related that I just I want to share related to 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 guilt and resentment and what have you. Uh, somebody interviewed me the other day, and they had in, interviewed Bernie Siegel, who I wrote uh, my earlier book with. Uh, uh, I interviewed him a couple of years ago. Really? Yeah. I forgot which Correct. book it was about because he's written so many books. But yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's yeah, he's really a great wonderful. guy. And um, and and Bernie had said to this interviewer apparently um, uh, that um, that the, if you were um, that if you were the only kind of caregiving that really should should uh, happen is is the caregiving that that or the caring that comes out of full heartedness you know that it's that it's done freely and openly and what have you and and from what I was hearing from this interview I didn't hear it directly from Bernie but. That um, if it's out of guilt or resentment, you know, like that's that's not worth anything, you know. And my response was uh, to that was um, I love Bernie and I could really understand. Of course, we want caring to come from that, um, but if 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 caring that comes out of guilt and resentment or whatever is all that's available, then that is better than non-caring at all. And that maybe it transforms itself. Um, and I had a conversation with somebody yesterday who said that a few years ago, that's exactly how she took, you know, how she assumed the role of taking care of her mother. She really was resentful. They had their history. And, but what happened over time is that she did a lot of healing on her own about understanding her mother's uh, life and like that her mother's, all the roles that her mother had that gave her uh, a, a sense of identity we're gone and you know she just was really kind of feeling living kind of an empty life and so her acceptance of her mom really really uh, uh took you know took over the, the the resentment and she said that also some healing happened for her mom um along the way i'm glad so, you brought that story up because you know it's so true at the end the whole relationship can evolve and i've my in my experience and with uh dying friends and family um it it kind of reflects what you're saying because sometimes all those barriers to the relationship just kind of fall by the wayside and people who are dying will start to share things with you that they never would before a parent a best friend whoever um because they know that it's at the end so some of that stuff does or can get resolved yeah even if you start yeah so and we bring whatever you know what just like what you were saying before about the siblings you know we bring we 
we, we bring what we bring to those to those situations. You, you know, caregiving is not something that you plan for 30 years ahead of time. <laughs> Usually it's dropped in your lap, you know. So, um, so it is, it, you know, if you can see it as an opportunity to do exactly what you're talking about, um, it can really happen. And um, it, uh, uh, it, it was, it certainly, I was very fortunate with my dad that we did our healing uh, well before, you know, we had a, we had a, a you know, a, a typically, you know, feisty relationship and uh, <laughs> father son. <the>, yeah. <laughs> and we, but we, I mean, we had very, very, very wonderful healing between us. Uh, and, and the, 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 the intimacy that caregiving for, for him required, uh, uh, was, was just some of the m most poignant time that, he and I ever had. I mean, so we didn't have to break through barriers, but we really got so much more connected. So you ha that was a good ending. We have to say goodbye. Yeah. Yosef August, Coaching for Caregivers, How to Reach Out Before You Burn Out. And we can go to your website, yes to life com. Thanks so much for being on the show this morning. I really enjoyed Thank the you. conversation. I love it. Yeah, too. I did too. Maybe we'll speak again. We'll speak again. Yeah. Have a good day. Sure. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 We only have a couple more minutes because um, our next show is coming on. Jaja Couture uh, in a different outfit every time she walks in. Um, Alyssa and I wear the same outfit every time. No, not really. But <laughs> yeah, this is, a good, this is a good how to book for caregiving. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. definitely going to use the yeah. free, uh, the advantage of the free book on Veterans Day. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely some good tips because it's a situation that we all could have a book because we never know if we'll be in that situation. Um, so, it's definitely something to have and maybe even get an advanced read so you have a little knowledge about the topic before. When is Veterans Day? Is it this Tuesday? No, or? no. The, mo the Monday, the, uh, the 11th. The 11th. Yeah. yeah. So, I am really two off. Two Mondays from now. Oh, we have you know, Columbus Day, Veterans Day. You know, I, oh, I forget you know, when they are. Okay. So, so that's. Yeah. Mark it on your calendars. Free book on Amazon.com. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I read my books on uh, my i my iPad. Yeah. I don't have a Kindle. I have the. What do you have? I'm doing a survey before we get off. Uh, I have. Because we have three minutes. <laughs> I have Two the minutes. Kindle app for uh, my tablets and my phone, so I just read it on there. So you're a Kindle guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason I like my iPhone is because I mean my i my iPad because I can do everything with it. I watched two documentary films yesterday on that thing fantastic one on breast cancer by the way which was an excellent documentary um you can i can skype on it i can do i can watch films i can watch television i can download books it has everything maybe the kindle does too does it yeah no the new kindles do but i have one of the google tablets and i just have the kindle app so um i i'm Unfortunately, going to do a plug for Amazon. They give free Prime. You're not allowed to. We could. Oh. We can't do a plug for anything. They give free Prime to students, though, which is a wonderful thing. You get free day, free two day shipping. So because of that, I've become a loyal Amazon customer. Yeah. We can't comment. Yeah. <laughs> can't say a word. All right. I guess. Well, Alyssa, do you want to have the last word? I just think it was a, yeah. gr a great, um, a great book, and I'm very. I think y Yosef had a lot of great topics, uh, not topics, I should say, um, subtopics within the main topic yeah. of caregiving about, and it addresses a lot of the issues that. Oh, you know, as he was saying things, I was shaking my head like, yes, I, 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 I've seen that before. I've witnessed it. I, you know, I felt that way, and and definitely he hits on a lot of topics, even the topics that people don't always like to talk about. So I'm definitely looking forward to uh, his read. Great. Well, you've been listening to the Social Workers Radio Talk Show with Alyssa Lotmore and me, uh, Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone, and Luke Stein on the board. And uh, univer did I say University at Albany, WCDB? I, think I forget what I say. I say it so kind of rotely, so I'm not sure if I've said it or not. But anyway, WCDB we're going to... WCDB Albany. Yeah, WCDB Albany. Uh, have a great week, and we'll see you guys next Thursday.